just turn to someone and say, nice to see you. How many grateful that we're here this morning? Amen. Amen. We can stand knowing that we're in this house and we came to give God glory because He deserves all the glory and the honor this morning. Amen. Amen. So the past few days have been somewhat up and down. It's been a bit cold. But I just want you to know that, you know what? The reason you are here is because you're on fire for Jesus this morning. So if you came to glorify, I just want you to lift your hands up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can stand in your presence knowing that your name will be glorified this morning. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we long to praise you for who you are, Father God. We thank you that everything that is accomplished this morning. And above all else, Father God, we thank you that your will will be done in this place. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. When I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. When I'm broken and down to nothing, we sing it out this morning, come on. I know that you are always up to something. Nothing your love won't endure. I know that you are always up to something good. Even through the deepest valley, you go before me, you are here. For I know you'll never leave me, your love surrounds me. I won't fear, and when I'm broken, yeah, and down to nothing, I know, I know that you are always up to something good. I know that you are always up to something good. You make a way. that you are always up to something good. Through the darkest night, you are on my side. You are always faithful. Through all fear and doubt, you will lead me out. You are always through the darkest night, you are on my side. You are always faithful. Through all fear and doubt, you will lead me out. I know you are always able. You're faithful. I know that. Oh, the
Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink all the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Let's sing it out this morning, come on. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and all, son to save us, whoever believes in him. We'll live forever. Take 30 seconds to thank Jesus for something he's done.
Your name is majestic. Thank you, Jesus. Your name be lifted up this morning. In the name of Jesus. morning I just get this image of a little kid playing touches and how you'll, you'll see little ones when they run around they get so excited and then they stop because now someone's chasing them it's the same thing with us and Father God because the more we run God chases us and the goodness that follows and if we just stop and say you know what Father God thank you for this goodness you know when a little one lies down and you tickle them and they oh, they can't do anything about it God's goodness is running after us. No matter where we hide, no matter what we do, God's goodness follows us. No matter what the circumstance is, God's goodness follows us. When you're walking and you think, I'm alone on this, you're not. Because Daddy God's next to you and the goodness is following you. So the following of the goodness comes from the good, good Father. Amen. And be like that little kid. And just let it cover you because God's goodness is following and it's running after us and no matter how fast we run and how far we run it follows us and I'm so grateful that I've got a daddy God that's going to follow me and send his goodness no matter if I'm hiding under my covers and when God I can't do this I can because God's goodness follows me we're going to sing that bridge again and I want you to get that picture this morning I want you to hold on to it God's goodness follows you. No matter what you did yesterday, goodness is coming. Whatever you're going to do tomorrow, it's still coming. God is a loving God. Amen? Are you ready to sing it out this morning? You're, you're allowed to sing a little bit loud this morning. Amen? Your goodness is running out. It's running out. about the miracles that God has done and sometimes we read the Bible 
like when we were kids, we read a comic book, you know, saw all the superpowers and all those amazing things, went, wow. But do you realize that the God who performed all of these miracles is inside each and every one of us by His Holy Spirit? Here's the incredible thing. The power of God is alive inside of you. And I started to go through the miracles that have taken place in the, just in the Old Testament. Not the miracles that Jesus did, not the miracles that Peter did, that Paul did. Just the miracles of the Old Testament. And I thought to myself, how incredible is this God of ours. He just caused walls of a major city just to fall down. The walls were so thick that chariots could ride on top of the walls. And they just crumbled. We think, wow, that's an amazing thing. Here's something else. He caused an axe head to float. An axe head. Yeah. Wow. Yes, it's in the Bible. Read it. He caused the sun to stand still. Even to move back. That's the God that we serve. The natural realm is subject to Him, our supernatural God. And so you might be standing here today, you say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm battling with this. Here's the thing. He brought water out of a rock, caused quail to fall from the sky, put manna on the ground, had a cloud by day, lead the Israelites and a fire by night. He never left them alone. Realize this. God is a miracle working God and whatever miracle you're looking for, God is able to do it. Now I just pray that the people that I share this testimony about today are not angry at me. But there's a couple in this church they came to see me this week. Their family is overseas. And it looked like an impossibility. It didn't just look like an impossibility. Based on their bank account, it was an impossibility. There was no way ever that they were going to get to be with their children. But the desire of their heart and the cry was God make a way. And their lease on their current rental property expires or comes to an end on the 31st of May. And they get a phone call. And their son says to them, I've booked you a ticket. Both of you are coming over. They thought they're going for a holiday. He said, no, you're coming here. You're going to be with me. You know what day they're leaving? The 31st of May. God is a miracle working God. He still does miracles today. Don't tell me he doesn't, because I've seen it. Yeah. And so today, right where you are, whatever the miracle is that you are trusting God for, let's pray. Let's pray and trust God that that miracle comes to pass. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're the God who sent manna, who opened the Red Sea, 
who caused an axe head to float, who raised the widow's son, who caused the cruise of oil and the jar of flour never to run out. You are that God and nothing is impossible for you. And so right now, Lord, we're trusting you for our miracle. Whatever that miracle is, each of us right now is trusting you. Bring about that miracle, Lord, because only you can do it. No man, no organization, no circumstance can do what you can do. So God, we're trusting you right now for that miracle. Bring it about. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. God is great, amen. You know, when Tracy started talking about God following us, I thought she was going to steal part of my, my sermon. And I'm, from now on, I'm not leaving my notes down there. Because people keep reading the notes and then saying things. But I'm so blessed that we serve a God who never wants to leave us alone. You know, ever been around somebody, and I, I know this doesn't happen to any of you, you know, you don't ever get into a disagreement with your spouse or anybody else. He never said, just leave me alone. Just, just leave me alone for five minutes. Well, guess what? You can never say that to God. Because he's not about to leave you alone. Even when you say to him, leave me alone, he's still coming. He's still coming. And he's still coming. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. I was asked to remind, you know, all the mothers in the church gave me a note this morning to remind everybody here that next week is Mother's Day. You've got an entire week to get everything together that you need to. But here's the one thing that every mom wants. Every mom wants her family to be with her in church on Mother's Day. So next week, get you early because we know this. We've seen it over and over again. The church fills up on Mother's Day. Mothers, thank you so much for making sure your family gets to church on Mother's Day. So next week, come along. We've got a special blessing for all the moms next week. We've got a blessing for everybody, in fact, not only the moms, but uh, come along, we're going to have a great time next week. And then uh, just to remind you, the street store, if you have got time, sort out your cupboards, bring some of the clothing that you no longer wear, and uh, bring it here. Today we've got a whole pile already. Uh, Pastor Jeremy did a couple of trips this week, and I guess next week even more trips to go and drop the stuff off at uh, Doxa Deo. And uh, thank you to all of those that have offered to assist on that day. We'll be in contact with you during the course of the week, let you know what the program is, and uh, we're going to minister to the people in Alberton. Amen? The, the people on the streets, we're going to show them the love of Christ right throughout Alberton. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go into God's word today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is truth and life. Thank you, Father God, that this word today, as a seed will be planted in our hearts, we'll tend it, and it will produce much fruit, Lord, so that you are glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we started last week looking at 20 questions. And, uh, you know, it caused some 
differences of opinion, the questions that I posed. Thank God the questions that are in the Bible can't pose that same difference of opinion because it's already resolved, amen? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some questions today that God posed in the Bible. Last week we looked at questions that others posed. But this week, we're going to take a look at the questions that God posed in the Bible. And uh, here's the first one. You know, this is the first recorded question by God. It's not the first recorded question in the Bible, because we already discussed that one last week. That was when the serpent said, has God really said? Well, here's the first question that God asks. And this is why... I said, uh, Tracy was trying to steal my message because the first question God ever asks in the Bible is, where are you? And that's found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. It says, when the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Here's the second question. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Third question. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me that gave me this fruit, and I ate it. Men are incredible beings. It was this woman that thou gavest me, Lord. You know, when a guy doesn't want to go somewhere, he says, no, I'll check with my wife. You know, when he gets invited to a braai to watch the rugby, he just makes the agreement, no problem, and tells his wife, hey, we're going there to watch the rugby and have a braai. But when it's some place he doesn't want to go, he says, no, I'll just check with my wife and I'll get back to you. If ever your friends say that to you, be sure they don't want to be there. Because he's going to come back and say to you, no, my wife said, no, we've got something on that day. She's going to make me watch the lawn grow or I don't know. But here's Adam And here's God say to him, where are you? Now, God knew exactly where Adam was. And what he was doing is he wanted Adam to come clean about what had happened. When my children were growing up, I always told them this. You own your mistake. You own it. Don't try and lie to me. If you've done it, You own it, we deal with it, it's over. But if you lie to me, it just gets worse. And so what happens is God says, where are you? And so finally he he says, I was hiding away. And then God says to him, gives him a second chance to come clean. Well, how did you know you were naked? Who told you that? And then he asks him the question that comes to the exact answer that God was looking for in the first place. He says, have you eaten the forbidden fruit? You see, because he had disobeyed, he was hiding from God. He had fallen into sin and now he was afraid. Those of you who are parents will attest to this. If your child has done something wrong and they come to you, you're more apt at that point to love on them and deal with whatever they've done rather than have to find out You know, I never figured this out when I was a child. I always tried to hide everything away. And my parents found out 
More often than not, my parents got the phone call from school. By the time I got home, they asked me a question. You know, my father would ask me a question that wasn't even related to what had happened, just to see how I would respond. And then I'd tell some long fabricated story, and then you'd say to me, um, well, that's not what your teacher said. And then I was uitgevang. Too bad. Now it was done. But you see, if I'd dealt with it straight away, my dad wouldn't have gone to those things, and I wouldn't have been afraid. I wouldn't have been in this position where I was like, Stansel broek baas is toch in bang nie. And that's the way we need to be with God. Own it. Repent of it. And God's word tells us that he will forgive us and he will wash us and cleanse us. And so, you see, this is the same question that God has asked mankind throughout the ages. Man has continually run and hidden from God. And God, for his part, has always looked for the lost. In Luke chapter 15, verses 3 to 7, it says this. So he told them this parable. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost, searching until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he gets home, he calls his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. God is constantly looking for those that are lost. His loving arms are stretched out to them. And we need to recognize that. The love of God that is inside of us should compel us to minister to those who don't know Christ. It says here that when he finds it, he goes home rejoicing. God rejoices when somebody finally turns around and says, here I am, Lord. I messed up. Even if they say it was this woman that thou gavest me, at least they stopped hiding. God can then start dealing with the situation. So my question to people today is this. If God asked the question, where are you? What would your answer be? Are you in the place that God has prepared for you? Are you in the place and walking in the things that God has designed for you? Are you living in the place that God has spoken to you about in your heart? Or are you living with one foot this side and one foot this side, just hoping that somewhere along the line you'll get 50%? We need to be listening to God so that he doesn't have to ask us that question, where are you? The second question that we find in the, in, in the book of Genesis chapter 3 is uh, found in verse 13. It says, Then the Lord God said to the woman, He asked the man earlier on, Where are you? Now he speaks to the woman. And he says, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, Now earlier on, all the women laughed when I said, Men are quick to pass the buck. Guess what the woman said? The serpent beguiled and deceived me, and I ate from the forbidden tree. The man went, this woman that thou gavest me, and the woman just pointed like I said, no, it was the serpent. But the, the question that was asked is, what is this that you have done? 
again, God was trying to get Eve to take responsibility. You know, it's like little children that get caught red-handed. They still try and blame someone else. Nobody wants to take responsibility. That's the way it has been with sin. That's the way it is with sin. And that's the way it'll continue to be with sin. We all think, no, 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 I, I take responsibility. No. We're like that little child, even when they get caught, tries to come up with an answer. Just uh, watch this uh, short clip quickly. John, what are you eating? Okay. You didn't eat anything. Yeah. Okay. John, look at mommy. Anything. Are you telling me the truth? That. You okay. didn't have any snacks? Yeah, nope. Let me see. You don't have any snacks. Open wide, let me see. Really? You didn't have any snacks? Yeah. John, come here. John, can you explain to me why, why the sprinkles are empty? Well, they're not empty. John, look at me. They're not empty. Did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not. You know it's not nice to tell stories and to lie, right? Look at Mommy. You're not supposed to lie. Tell me now. Did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not eat those sprinkles. John, mm -hmm. you have sprinkles on your face. Did um, no, no. I did not eat sprinkles. Did not. <laughs> yeah, we all understand that. But here's the thing. When God asked Eve, what is this thing that you have done? If Eve could have seen through the ages, she would have known what she had done. She would have seen the sin, the violence, the murder, the lust, the pride, the broken families, the desperation, and the loneliness. She would have seen the result of that sin. But she couldn't. And it's just like us. We only see our present situation. And then what we do is we make the wrong choice or we do the wrong thing. And it's almost like we can hear God saying to us, what is this thing that you have done? Because there are consequences that come down the line. The next question that we find is, what is your name? And that's found in Genesis 32, 24 to 29. And what happens is, in this portion of Scripture, Jacob wrestles with God the whole night, and he, he won't quit. And then what happens is, he says, I'm not going to quit unless you bless me. And so the question is then asked of him, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. And then immediately, the man tells him, from now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. You see, Jacob means trickster or con man, snake oil salesman. You know, the old English word is supplanter. Somebody who comes along and tricks others. And yet, God had something more for him. And God changes his name to Israel, which means has the power of a prince. So he goes from being a con man to having the power of a prince. See, God has always been in the business of changing people. And a change of name is just an outward sign of that inward change. Now, I know there are a lot of 
ministries that go around telling you or telling people, when you get born again, you must change your name. Your name has already been changed. They may still call you Chris or Jeremy or Sean, but here's what your name has been changed to. It's been changed from dead to living. It has already been changed. And so, what this portion of Scripture tells us, it tells us that there's a change of identity. The identity changes, and that's why the name was asked. Well, our identity changes when we get born again. You see, we have a new identity in Christ. See, too many Christians only see themselves by their first birth. But the more important birth is the second birth. The one where we are born again. That is the one we need to see ourselves as. After Jacob's name changed to Israel... He didn't call himself Jacob at some points and Israel at other points. When he was having a low day, he didn't say, my name is Jacob. His name had been changed. Your name has been changed. You are now alive in Christ. You're not alive one day and then dead the next. You are alive in Christ, redeemed, set free, Delivered. The apple of God's eye. And if you were me, you could be God's favorite. But that's what you have to understand. When we are asked, what is your name? Names always mean something. But not my name. Even though it's Sean, my name is Child of the Most High King. The next question is, what is in your hand? Found in Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, it says this, but Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, What is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw it down the staff and it turned to a a snake. Moses jumped back, but then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it and turned back to a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, And of Jacob really appeared to you. So Moses meets God at the burning bush. And God says to him, I want you to be my spokesperson and go to Pharaoh and get my people back. But Moses thinks that he doesn't have the skills or the ability to do what God asks. How many of us, and don't put up your hands, because probably all of us, have felt when God has told us, to speak to somebody or pray for somebody, we felt, no, no, I I can't do that. I I can't do that. Well, that's what happened with Moses here. He's saying, I can't do that. I don't have the ability. And so what happened is, God says to him, what is in your hand? See, God was showing him that it's not about his ability Moses' ability, it's about God's ability. You see, God could take whatever was in the hand of Moses, which was natural, and change it because of the supernatural. God was able to do something that superseded the natural. I mean, you can go outside now. We've got trees all over the place. Cut down a branch. Please don't cut down our trees, but... Go to the neighbor's house, cut down the, no, don't do that, we're supposed to be loving. But get a stick, throw it on the ground, and let's see if that thing turns into a snake. 
No, because in the natural, you and I have no ability to do that. But God's supernatural ability supersedes the natural. You see, God may be asking you, what is in your hand? What is it that you have? What is it that I can use for the benefit of somebody else? God's not looking for our ability, but our availability to be used by him. The more that we allow God to use the little that is in our hand, the more glory God gets. Because when you only have a little to offer and God changes it, he's the only one who can get the glory. It can't be, oh, well, that person, no, it's God. The next question is number five, whom shall I send? And this is found in Isaiah chapter six, verses five to eight. I'm not going to go through the whole portion of Scripture, but what happens is this. Isaiah sees the glory of God. He sees the incredible array of God's majesty in these portions of Scripture. And then, in verse 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. You see, God still uses weak people like us for his glory. He's still doing that. In the previous portions of scripture, Isaiah had seen the glory of God. The incredible majesty of God. And now, because of that, he says, here I am, send me. But we have to understand that is both a privilege and a responsibility. You can't just say, send me for the pat on your back. Because you have to recognize that it's going to cost something if you say, send me. How would you respond if you heard God's voice this, uh, today saying, whom shall I send? Or who will go for us? If I was honest, I'd probably be thinking, exactly what do I have to do? And where is it that you want me to go? Hawaii? Pick me. Send me. But no, when we hear God say Ukraine or Uzbekistan, we're like, ah, Lord, send this woman that thou gavest me. No, man. You know, I'm thinking, you're not going to go pick me, pick me. It's going to be like the army. They ask for a volunteer. We need volunteers for this. Okay, you, 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 and you. There we go. They're the volunteers. Because nobody would volunteer for anything. I mean, the guys who knew certain things, when they, everybody was standing in a line they said they need volunteers. The guys who knew stepped back. The guys who weren't watching around, they, they standing now in front. Okay, yeah, you guys come, let's go. But that's what it's like sometimes in the kingdom of God. God is saying, whom will I send? It's like everybody takes a step back. No. We need to recognize that because of God's glory and majesty, anything he asks us to do, he will accomplish it. We don't have to accomplish it. The next one, this is the second last one for today. Do you have a good reason to be angry? How's that question? It's found in Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. And in verse 4, then the Lord said, do you have a good reason to be angry? My wife has asked me this about a thousand times, especially when I've been in the car. 
what are you getting so angry for? Just let it go. You know, I was ahead of my time. You know, when, uh, when Karen and myself were dating and when we got married, I mean, that was, that was in a, a different century. It was in a different millennium. How's that? And everybody thought that, what's that uh, Elsa and Frozen? Everybody thought Frozen was from the, the, the 21st century. No, because way back then, Karen was saying to me, let it go, let it go. <laughs> She's telling me that. But what happens with Jonah is Jonah wanted God to punish the Assyrians in Nineveh. He wanted to see God's judgment, like us sometimes. You see something going on, you say, Lord, send the fire. I'll step away. I love you. That's what Jonah did. Here's the th it was a strange thing for a preacher to do. Because when I'm preaching the word, I'm hoping that people will hear what I have to say, hear what God's word says, realize that God's a loving God and come back to him. That's what happened here. But guess what? Jonah gets mad about it. He's like, ah, yerich on your straf. That's what, that's what Jonah was on about. And then God says to him, do you have a good reason to be angry? You see, why should we be angry because we serve a gracious and loving God? Jonah was angry because of something that God did and didn't do. He was angry that God didn't punish them, and he was angry because God forgave them. Sometimes we get angry at God for things that happen or for things that don't happen. Exactly the same as Jonah. Here's the question. Do you have a good reason to be angry? Because we always need to keep in mind that God doesn't only see the present. He knows the past and he's already seen the future. And so when we say to God, no, we want that Lamborghini, and we don't get the Lamborghini, it's because he knows we would be locked up on the first day because our right foot is too heavy. I put an extra heel in my left shoe so that now my feet are now evened out. They're both equally heavy. But God knows. And yet we still get angry. God also takes into account the, the motives of the heart. We try and con God. We think we can con God like we con other people. Oh, I love you. Will you give me this? From tiny, man, children do that. They go to school. The one kid's got 50 bucks for tuck money. The parent was half asleep, was looking, thought it was a 10 buck note, gave them a 50 rand note. They get to school. Guess who is the kingpin of the class? The kid with the 50 bucks. Everybody wants to be that child's friend today. Remember, we're best friends. Can I have a chip? Oh, remember, I'm your best friend. Can I have a sweet? That's what we do with God sometimes. We try and con him. Oh, Lord, you know, I've been so holy and righteous. I haven't done this. I haven't done this. I haven't done this. Oh. No. God is not in the bargaining game. Here's what God is doing. He's gracious, he's merciful, and he's kind toward us. We don't have to try and con him. The last question for today is, 
Son of man, can these bones live? That's found in Ezekiel 37 verses 1 to 3. And I'm not, it'll be worth your while to read the entire chapter. But he sees this valley of bones. And then God asks this question, can these bones live? And then God says to him, well, after he says to God, only you know, God says prophesy to the bones. And he speaks. And the bones start rattling. And they come together. And then there's tendons and sinew and muscle and skin. And the bones come to life. You see, today I want to tell you this. It doesn't matter how dead something looks in your life. God can bring it to life. God can restore it once again. And I said earlier on, when we get born again, our lives change from dead to living, death to life. And so today you have that opportunity. I'd like you to close your eyes, bow your heads very quickly. Today you have that opportunity to move from death to life because we have a gracious, loving Father. And so if that's you today, you want to make right with God, you want to come back to God, you want to be like those people in Nineveh, receive His grace and His mercy, then all you have to do is indicate to me by raising your hand so that I know I need to say a prayer for you. Is there anybody here that would like to make right with God today? Quickly, slip up your hand so that I know I need to say a prayer for you. I see that hand over there. Anybody else? Quickly, just slip up your hand. I see that hand over there. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray a prayer for you. And at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you just quickly, come down and see me. I've got something for you. I'd like to give you a blessing. Father, we pray for those who have made the decision today. Thank you, Lord God, that they've gone from death to life. That today, they are born again. They are your child. You've come looking for them, and they have been found today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. If you've got your communion elements, please get them out. If you don't, please quickly slip up your hands so the deacons could get some to you. Everybody got their communion elements? Amen. Seeing that we were asking questions, I thought I'd continue that with the communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 15 to 17, it says this, I assume I'm addressing believers who are now mature. Draw your own conclusions. And here's the question. When we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And then the second question, and isn't it the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in Him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what He is. Because of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are made one. And we are receiving the life of Christ, the body of Christ. So right now, Lord, we thank You that your body was broken, but we now have oneness with you. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done in Jesus' name. Let's eat together. In verse 15 there said, when you drink the cup of blessing, this is the cup of blessing, the cup that paid for us with the blood of Christ. And so, Lord, we honor you today. We say thank you for pouring out your blood for us. 
thank you for your abundant blessing and provision. We receive it in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. The deacons can just wait. You can do it, the offering and the cups at the same time. What we'll do now is I just want to share scripture with you, but at the same time, share testimony. It says this in Deuteronomy 16, verse 17, every man shall give as he is able in accordance with the blessing which the Lord God has given you. I'm so blessed that on Good Friday, we made a decision we said that the entire offering on Good Friday would go to the KZN Relief Fund. Well, here's what happened. On Good Friday, God poured out abundance, and we were able to send 30,000 rand to cost. That's a group of NGOs with, of churches in KZN, and they are providing flood relief right now. Because of your generosity, people's lives are being changed. And so we know that we give in accordance with what God has already placed into our hands. And so, Father, we thank you for our giving right now. Thank you, Father, for what you have blessed us with, your provision. We open our hands and return it in glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Deacons, deaconesses, please receive the tithes and offerings and collect the communion cups. While they're doing that, let me remind parents, youth and .com are back. They're operating again. Please remember Friday evenings, bring your children. They have a great time here. This last... Uh, this Friday past, I mean, I saw the youth up top there. They were, they were having a blast. They were toasting marshmallows and all kinds of things. And I was like, they, you know, they never offered me one. Not, not one. I, I was hoping that they, no, I'm only kidding. Danielle did offer me one and I told her I don't eat it. See, she was sitting there staring at me like this, like, I did offer him. <laughs> Hallelujah. But bring your, bring your children. They have a great time. I pray God's richest blessings over you. I thank the Lord that his hand is upon you for good. I pray that everything you put your hands to this week will prosper. And that God's anointing will be upon you. And that you will be saying these words. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Lord, we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.